Right. So the fifth century, the 400s to the 500s. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to add a footnote to our conversation about Augustine. I told you something of his story and especially his conversion connected with the ministry of Ambrose. So that was a couple of weeks back. If you were here, you recall that. We didn't do too much about his thought. And I thought it was a little bit of neglect on my part not to at least say something about the contribution that he made, although again, this is so cursory and inadequate, I'm embarrassed even to call it a summary of his thought, but nevertheless, at least a couple of points about him that uh, we should note as we go along. Many people have suggested of Augustine that he's the greatest Christian thinker of all time. That may be true. Certainly the greatest Christian thinker outside of New Testament writers of the first thousand years of the church's history. As I said, he's often regarded as the last of the church fathers, which represent those thinkers which populate the church's history, say in the first three or four hundred years, and on the other hand, the first of the medieval theologians, and certainly the greatest of them, unless we want to put him in competition with Thomas Aquinas, who would be the other great luminary that comes, of course, some 800 years later. But these two men certainly dominate thought in the church throughout most of her history. Augustine in his time was able to do something that others had attempted to do, but he does it in a way that really does have an impact in his own time and a lasting impact down through history, and that is he finds a synthesis. I say this very cautiously because it sounds like compromise, I don't mean that, but he does find a synthesis between Christian truth, which he learns from the Bible, and the kind of platonic elements of the culture in which he lived. It was not Platonism anymore, but it still had some of that going on. And he is able to find the language to communicate the Christian message into a culture in a way that had quite a significant impact. This has always been the challenge of the church. We always live as the church at a moment in history. We don't live in all of history. We're in conversation with it. And obviously we have a culture which is characterized by certain features, and if we ask ourselves, how do we faithfully, with integrity, take the truth of God and communicate it into this culture? It means we have to figure out how this culture communicates, what its language are, what the worldview is, and so on, in such a way that we become comprehensible. It's always a tightrope. If we're too rigidly connected to a sort of uh, articulation of the Christian faith that doesn't allow for anything of what's happening in the culture, then we we are incomprehensible to our generation. On the other hand, if we sell the farm, trying so much to be fashionable, to follow the latest fads, you know, to say things that are so up to date that it becomes indistinguishable from the world, then we've lost our potency as well. But somehow out there in the middle is the proper balance. Augustine certainly seems to have accomplished that. And really in many ways, you would say that for the next several hundred years of church history, the church was dominated by this kind of Augustinian view, which indeed itself was a kind of Platonic view. Nevertheless, it was in many ways truly faithful to the biblical teaching. So in his day, that's what he does. He fights several battles. There's many we could mention. The dominant ones that usually would be included here would be the Arians. We've talked about them before. Arianism had lost its seat at the table at the Con Council of uh, Constantinople in 381. Nicaea was Trinitarian, but in a way, you continue to see the Arians active in the church, sometimes holding major ecclesiastical offices, but by the time we get to Constantinople, that's pretty much over. The creed that's generated at Constantinople is sometimes called the Athanasian Creed because it was really the effects of Athanasius' labors that do produce this creed and so on. But Augustine, even later, is still fighting the battle with them. Probably the most important work that he produces is called De Trinitatus, of the Trinity. It was the most profound treatment of that topic that the church had seen to date and really continued to serve the church well and to this day is a very important treatise on that topic. He also confronted what were called the Donatists. The Donatists were, in a sense, a movement within the church that we would call radical purists. They wanted to hold the church to such a high standard of purity that after a while you weren't sure you could trust anybody. If any 
pastor or priest had in any way lapsed or deviated along the way. The Donatists said they could not be reinstated. And any sacraments they celebrated were not valid sacraments and so on. They kept trying to ratchet up the standard in a sense that it created in the church a kind of unreal atmosphere of suspicion of everybody and so on. And Augustine answers that in a very powerful way, setting forth a grand view, a vision of the church, which again became extraordinarily important down through history and was largely embraced by our Catholic friends more than Protestantism. The Catholics really did appreciate and kind of take to heart the vision of the church that came out of Augustine's writings in connection with the Donatist controversy. Nevertheless, much of what he says has been very helpful to all the church down through history. This would be in his writings, The City of God, if you're familiar with that, others of his writings. He especially sets forth what became the classic formulation of the church. It was already present, but he really gave it its most robust description that the church is one holy, what? Catholic and apostolic church. The oneness of the church, we might say, is its exclusiveness. There's only one, no competitors. There's only one church, and it is in that sense exclusive. So we don't countenance the idea that there would be multiple churches ultimately. There are denominations, obviously we're aware of that, but one true universal church in the world. It's holy. It is distinctly different. It is unique. There's nothing like it. There's no competitor to it in terms of what it is about. There's one and only one church in the sense that it is separate and different from any other institution in the world. It's Catholic. This would be the inclusiveness of the church. So there's an exclusiveness principle and an inclusiveness principle. The church is the same church regardless of your skin color, your socioeconomic status, your educational level, or anything else that might otherwise divide us up among ourselves. There's one church and the door is open to anyone who wants to come into it on, based on faith in Christ. This was one of the great sort of uh, sociological uh, effects of the church early on when you had slaves joining the church becoming leaders in the church and later their masters came and joined the same church and so here's the guy who owns a slave who's under that very slave authority in the church. You know, that does tend to upset the apple cart just a little bit sociologically. That kind of thing. It's, a, it's an apostolic church. It has authority. The authority is not intrinsic to the church in the sense that it's somehow just a function of the church's own muscle, but it's the authority that comes through the apostles from Christ himself. And so on all of those... Augustine gives a great vision of the character of the church that all of Christian history has appreciated. The other controversy in which Augustine was deeply involved was called the Pelagian controversy. Pelagius was a British monk. He lived uh, during the Christian era in British history, which would be in about the same time as Augustine, the early 400s. He took an odd view of the character of human sinfulness. He denied that there was such a thing as original sin. He believed that we all come into this world more or less in the same condition that Adam was before the fall. He believed that people could, just by dint of hard work, save themselves. He was one of the first radical liberals, you might say, in the history of the church, who believed in fundamental human goodness. And if you just kind of give yourself a good shot in the arm and work at it and buck up, you can make it just fine. Grace will help out, but you don't really need grace to be saved. It was that idea. Augustine just about went apoplectic on that one, you know, and responded to that in no uncertain terms. And this kind of public debate in their writings and so on really did call forth in some ways from Augustine the great doctrines of grace that, again, were so important in the church's history down through the ensuing centuries. He taught that we come into this world broken and indeed dead, helpless and hopeless, and that the only possibility we have of salvation is grace that breaks into our lives, uninvited, and changes our hearts, which are otherwise stony and unresponsive, and replaces those hearts with a heart of flesh. He believed, therefore, in predestination, that it's only as God reaches in and changes us that we are going to ever respond to him. And those do define more or less the two extremes in the church's history. I'd say most Christians in history have been somewhere in the middle between Augustine on the one hand and Pelagius on the other, finding some compromised view between them. 
However, it's worth noting that the reformers almost to a man embraced the Augustinian view. Luther, Calvin, Knox, Zwingli, all of these guys were strongly Augustinian, although we commonly call it Calvinism. We as Presbyterians are heirs of that reformed tradition, so we have been more or less unabashed historically in affirming that we believe the Bible teaches a strong and powerful view of our absolute need for grace in order for salvation to take place and that that grace comes to us sovereignly. And so even though I don't know where you'd find contemporary Presbyterians around the country, that certainly has been our classical heritage. My point here is that the, embra the reformers embraced that part of Augustinian teaching with a great deal of gusto. The church, that is the Catholic church, embraced Augustine's vision of the church with a great deal of gusto. Everybody wanted a slice of Augustine. Not everybody wanted the same slice of Augustine. And so what you get is this interesting sense in which Augustine has been important in all Christian history, but different traditions within the church have emphasized different aspects of his teaching. He's well worth reading. He wrote about 95 major works in his life, and it's any time you come across something by Augustine, it's certainly worth uh, noting. The other thing that takes place in this century, Augustine died in the year 430, by the way, uh, leaving this lasting imprint on church history. The other thing I want to just note in passing are the so-called ecumenical councils. They're called ecumenical councils because, as you probably know, the word ecumenical kind of stands for that which unites the entire church. These councils, there's seven of them in all, are generally embraced by all Christian people at all times in history. So they are points where we agree with our friends who are in different traditions. Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Protestant, we all unite at this point, shoulder to shoulder, saying these are things where we share a common conviction. Certainly there are things, important things that divide us, the conversation goes on, but at certain points we close ranks and say as Christians in the heritage of classical orthodoxy, these are things we affirm together. And these ecumenical councils are, as I say, seven in all, four of them have happened by the time we reach the fifth century. So just to quickly review this, this is always good church history trivia that you should have in case you're ever on, who wants to be a millionaire? And this question comes up. So this is practical. The first one was Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea, as you know, we talked about it a few weeks ago, rejected Arianism affirm Trinity. But the debate didn't go away. And so for the next 60 years or so, the church is embroiled in this controversy and Arians continue to have a rather prominent and visible role in the life of the church. So the Nicene Council did not put the thing to rest yet. Athanasius himself, as we tried to detail some time back, had to fight that battle sometimes it seems single-handedly against the forces of this Aryan threat. It did more or less come to rest, however, in the year 381 at the Council of Constantinople. This was a council that actually rejected a heresy called Apollinarianism, named for its founder, Apollinaris, who was trying to figure out how we understand Christ being both God and man. And what he gave was a highly refined form of Arianism much more sophisticated than you find in Arius himself, but nevertheless creating enough of a question that the church felt it was essential to meet once again and deal with the issue. Apollinaire's view was something like Christ is one-third God and two-thirds man, you see. Trying to figure out by way of a fraction how we understand this person of Christ. And the church was concerned that that does compromise both his humanity and his deity, and if it does that, it compromises our prospects for salvation. And so the church had good instincts at that point, reaffirmed Nicaea, restated Nicaea in a creed that has come traditionally to be called the Nicene Creed, even though it's a revision of the earlier creed that we looked at a few weeks ago. It was more liturgically useful in the church. It's also sometimes called the Athanasian Creed because of the influence that Athanasian, Athanasius had in developing the thought that went into it, even though he died about eight years earlier. So that's the second of the ecumenical councils. The third one is the council at Ephesus, 
That takes place in 431 at the city that goes by the same name in the New Testament, right there kind of at the western coast of Turkey. This was dealing with a, a character named Nestorius, who was actually a bishop in the church, who was very concerned about the use of the term Theotokos, which was becoming common in the church at that time. It means God-bearer. It would be something like saying Mary was the mother of God. He didn't like that. He objected to that. And out of that came an attempt to explain Christ. And he said, we must affirm not the Apollinarian distortion, that Christ is a fraction of God and a fraction of man. He must be truly God. He must be truly man. There must be two natures, Nestorius taught. But then it seemed to him, if there were two natures, by the nature of the case, there must be two persons. You see. If there's two natures, a God nature and a man nature, there must be two persons, a God person and a man person. And those were somehow united in that one being that we call Jesus of Nazareth. So if you had met Jesus there one day in Galilee, you know, hello, you would have been shaking hands with two people. A kind of schizophrenic Jesus, you see. And the church didn't like that too much. It appreciated the biblical teaching. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, not two not a committee, and it seems somehow in the instincts of the church that unless Christ is one, again, our salvation is put at risk. And so it rejects Nestorius, although you may be interested in knowing there are Nestorian Christians in the world to this day, not many, but there are still Christians who take that name and follow that view. There are not many in America, but there are here and there in places around the world. It's also been a view that's been picked up by certain movements outside Christian orthodoxy. For example, Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of Christian science, was clearly Nestorian. Whenever she approached Christology, she would describe Christ in those terms. So it's still with us, but the church at least officially rejects it there in the year 431. The last of these that we're going to cover this morning is called the Council of Chalcedon, or sometimes you'll hear it pronounced Chalcedon, either one is fine. The Council of Chalcedon in 451, just 20 years later, is treating the thought of a man who was present at the Council of Ephesus and was a great critic of Nestorius, whose name was Eutychus. And he developed a view called Eutychianism, which is fun to say, so there you are. Eutychianism was kind of the opposite of Nestorianism. Nestorius said Christ is two natures, two persons. Eutychius didn't like that. Eutychus didn't like that. So he took the opposite view. Christ must be one person. The unity of Christ was essential, but then that suggested in his mind Christ must be one nature. One nature, one person. How else could it be? Well, what's the nature of that nature? He said it's a theanthropic nature. Hope that clarifies that. It's a theanthropic nature. Theos, Greek word for God. Anthropos, the Greek word for man. Take the two, put them together in a mixing bowl, stir it up, you get some kind of stew that you call a mixed divine and human nature that stands behind the person of Christ. One person, one nature. The church gets together at Chalcedon and says... That doesn't quite do it either, because now, once again, it seems like we have a highly modified Arianism where Christ is neither God nor man, and we need him to be both somehow. And the church gets together and works this through and comes up with what has become the classic formulation, which is really, to this day, what Orthodox Christians have affirmed. You'll find this in the Westminster Confession of Faith. You'll find it throughout church history more or less in the same form that it was finally set forth at the Council of Chalcedon. And what they say is this, Christ is two natures, thank you Nestorius, you see, heretics sometimes help us. Christ is two natures and one person. Both heretics got partly right answers. But the church finally said the emphasis of each of them helps us see that the way we think about Christ is in this great mystery. Two natures, vera homo, vera deus, truly man, truly God. Each nature, fully, whatever it needs to be to be fully that thing, whether it's God or man, and yet the two natures are perfectly united in one person. 
The church never dreamt that it was actually explaining this. What the church was attempting to do was draw a perimeter around the truth of God, which it frankly acknowledged is mysterious, and the outside the perimeter would be essentially heresy. What the Council of Chalcedon is really doing is telling us what the doctrine of Christ is not, and leaving, in a sense, the question of the mystery there in that place where we look with reverence, and awe, but sometimes with less than full understanding. And that's really true, I think, of many points of genuine Christian theology. Cults have a good answer to every question. Christian orthodoxy has always modestly acknowledged we don't yet get it. We still see through a glass darkly. There's mystery there, not contradiction, not absurdity, not irrationality, but true mystery and at that point, we simply hush our mouths and say, we're worshiping this which is vastly greater than we can possibly fully comprehend. The church gave, therefore, the four famous negatives of Chalcedon, that these two natures coexist in one person without mixture, conversion, separation, or division. The natures don't convert or mix together, as Eutychus had said, nor are they divorced from each other, as Nestorius had said, Rather, they are perfectly united, each nature, they said, retaining its own attributes and perfectly united in the person of Christ. So that's the Council of Chalcedon, and I'm going to leave off this discussion of councils. We'll probably touch on the others later, but they come in later centuries. At the time we have left, I'd like to turn to Christian missions that really became one of the most important features of the 5th century as well. And, of course, the character that we're especially interested in is St. Patrick. Patrick was born in 389 in what we would call England, or what was called Britain at that point, or the place of the Brits, you know. 389, and in order to get him into context, let's just remind ourselves briefly what had been happening in that part of the world back for a a couple of hundred years. You may recall that Claudius Caesar conquered Britain in 44 and years ensuing, He, of course, was the Caesar, but he had no political experience, and so, in a sense, to prove himself, he launched a military campaign into Britain. The only other time the Romans had tried to do this was a hundred years earlier under Julius Caesar during the Gallic Wars. He went over, took a look around, said, this place is not for me, and he went home, you know. So Julius Caesar is one of the the opportunities he had that he decided to... uh, Uh, let go because he had enough going on back in the Gallic Wars. But anyway, he made a little incursion, but it didn't amount to much. Claudius Caesar, on the other hand, goes into the region of Britain planning to stay. And so over time, the Roman presence expands. This continued to take place over several decades until finally we get to that point where the uh, the Roman expansion north through the British island reaches what's called Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is there kind of toward the neck of the British island. Who's been to Hadrian's Wall? It's got a few in there. It's quite a structure. It, I think, is mostly intact and it spans that entire uh, region there. There was actually another wall that was built further north by Antoninus Pius about the mid-2nd century, but the Romans were never able to hang on to it, nor did they really have the will to hang on to it. So Hadrian's Wall became the official demarcation of the northern part of the island. Why didn't they keep going north? Because they were very scary people up there, to be honest with you. (laughs) They were called Picts, P-I-C-T-S, which was a Latin word that meant painted. And these Scots that were up there to the north uh, just looked, it it was a rough country and who needed it? And these people were really, you know, kind of threatening. So they decided to let Scotland alone and it retained its independence even at the time that the, uh, Uh, Roman presence was there to the south. The conversion of Constantine, of course, had the widespread effect of bringing Christianity to Britain. And this took place in the mid-fourth century. So you begin having, by about the year 340, 350, this is a little bit of a misstatement, certainly Britain was not Christianized in in any thorough sense, but you have the beginnings of a Christian missionary interest in Britain 
that begins around the year 340, 350, and so on. And so Christian monas uh, monks move there, they build monasteries, schools, and so on, and they have a Christian presence. Nevertheless, in Britain, there continued to be a kind of undercurrent of paganism. Those northern European tribes had been given over to a variety of pagan religions, as you're aware, and that didn't really go away, but over the top of it, kind of an overlay, was this Christian presence, and it did get some traction in that early period. Well, it's at this time that Patrick is born. So he's born in 389, at a time when the Christian presence in Britain is certainly visible, but it hasn't insinuated itself deeply into the DNA of these people who are populating it, Brit British people there at that time. And Patrick grew up in this culture that was at least touched by the Christian faith, but he didn't have much interest in it. His parents took him to church, and he was a member of the church, and so on. But he, he was, you know, just a kid and really was not too interested in taking it very seriously. And so just as a matter of family uh, kind of convention, he had that exposure to the Christian faith, but nothing much beyond that. In 405, when he's 16 years old, he was kidnapped by some slavers from Ireland. He had been left alone with the family farm for a few days. His parents were gone. He had the servants there and kind of in a surprise attack. Not uncommon, by the way, in those days. These Irish marauders came across. They'd make these quick incursions, grab whoever they could, throw them on a boat, and take them back to Ireland where they would become slaves. And Patrick was, in his teenage years, captured in that way and taken back to Ireland. And so in 405, he became a slave in Ireland, and he was there for six years. The six years that he spent in Ireland, as best we can tell from his descriptions of it, were probably this region, which, to be honest with you, looks pretty nice to me, you know, kind of idyllic. But I think if I were there as a slave, I'd probably have negative attitudes about it. But anyway, uh, Patrick was there. He was tending sheep, six years a slave in Ireland. What he noticed after he'd first kind of gotten there and gotten accustomed to his responsibilities and so on, was that the entire uh, Irish world was saturated with what was called the Druid religion. Now, you're probably familiar with Druidism, and it's a kind of pagan religion. They were in some ways rather ghastly in their practices. It's well documented that at least on occasion they would uh, have human sacrifice, a lot of animal sacrifice. It was loaded with superstition and fear. It was the worst of what you can imagine a dark world would look, out, look at like without the light of Christ in it. And people lived in this constant fear of what amounted to kind of witch doctor type folks, you know, who would do incantations and that sort of thing. And all of life was just steeped in this sort of superstitious outlook. And for the first time, Patrick appreciated the difference between any kind of Christian influence and this kind of pitch black sort of cultural effect where Christ is not present at all. And he began to see the difference during this six years, realizing that the Christian influence had been more important than he had appreciated earlier. He also, oddly enough, though he started out very resentful of those who had kidnapped him and taken him off to Ireland, began to have a certain de degree of pity for them. As he saw how swept away they were in these superstitious uh, views of things and so on, he actually, over time, began to develop a heart for these people, even though he was still in a state of slavery among them. This uh, certainly continued for some time, and this gradual change of attitude led him to more or less even sort of study these folks a little bit. And he learned the Gaelic language, and he began to think about, uh, you know, what someday he might even do among them. I mean, already that thought was in his mind, even though at this point there were no prospects for his successful escape from it. In 410, the Romans withdrew from Britain. You probably know the year 410 was an important year for Rome because that was the first time the city of Rome itself was invaded and sacked by these marauding, gothic, barbarian forces. They finally made it to the heart of the Roman world and sacked and plundered that city. And the insult to the Roman psyche was profound 
and Rome realized finally now that they, you know, they had to regroup. And all of the Roman forces that were strung out around the ancient world kind of came back, and this begins to be the collapse of the Roman Empire as such, as these Roman forces are coming home to fight the battle to defend Rome herself, the eternal city, you see, under attack at this point. And so the island of Britain is abandoned, and Britain itself kind of goes back into a more, we would say, non-Christian sort of outlook. This was a tumultuous time, and there was a little bit of upset as a result of that, even in Ireland, even though Ireland was not occupied by the Romans. Patrick, for his part, believed that at some point he would be able to escape. And by his own record of this later, he says that he was visited in a night vision and told that the time was near, just a few days, until he would escape from this slave status in Ireland. And so he was kind of on the lookout. And as it turns out, within about a week or so, he was in a situation where he was basically unattended, not on that com uncommon, but he viewed that as his opportunity. And he took a huge risk. He was about 50 miles from the shore, from the, uh, from the uh, what, uh, seaport town. And so he just runs pell-mell as hard as he could down the road. Now, it, was not, it didn't go well for runaway slaves who were caught in those days, as you can imagine. And so he was doing this at some degree of risk. He was still a young man, 21, and he's just running for all he's worth down this road, 50 miles to this seaport town. I don't know which town it was, but just as he got there, he ran to the seaport, hoping desperately to get on a boat and be spirited away from Ireland and back to freedom. There was one boat that was leaving right at that moment. He ran up to the, the ship's captain, fell on his knees, grabbed the guy by the shirt, you know, and begged him to let Patrick get on this boat. He said, I'll do anything. You know, I'll clean up any mess. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Just let me get on the boat. And the captain said, no way. He, he wanted no dealings with runaway slaves. And Patrick thought he was done for. You know, this was his only hope. He was going to be caught any time. And so, and the captain was just firm, adamant. No way, I'm going to take you back. Patrick, the, 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 the uh, captain turns away to in, get involved in another business. Patrick is standing there just dejected and, and wondering what in the world is going to happen. Two of the ship's mates had seen this whole thing, came up to Patrick just a moment later on the side and just said, come with us. And they just spirited him onto the boat and into the hold under the luggage, you know, down deep inside. And so just stay there, don't make any moves. And so Patrick, for about four hours, is down at the bottom of this boat, hiding out, and eventually he feels it pull away, and off they go to sea. And then, Patrick, of course, is brought out. The captain is very angry, but no one will admit to have done it, doing it, you know. So what are you going to do? He wasn't going to throw the guy overboard, so he put Patrick to work. Patrick was used to work, and he became everybody's slave on that boat, but he was so grateful to do it that he... Uh, viewed this as nothing less than a gift of God, you know, for him to be able to escape from Ireland. Patrick tells the story later that they got caught in a storm and blew up against some rocks, a very rocky and uh, rugged coast. He wasn't sure where it was, somewhere on the island of Britain, probably north, more towards Scotland. And they, the ship wrecked, uh, actually uh, crunched up against the coast there, and these sailors swam to shore, and there they were, destitute, on the shore in, uh, in some place, they didn't know quite where. And they had no food, and there was nothing in the immediate area that looked like it would sustain them. They went for three or four days, no food, and it was getting somewhat desperate. And finally the captain, who knew that Patrick claimed to be a Christian, came to him and said, hey man, you keep bragging about this God you say you worship. Well, why doesn't this God send us some food, huh? We're going to die out here. He's kind of brutal, you know. And Patrick said to the man, this is his own testimony, if you will give your heart to Christ, if you will bow the knee here and now and acknowledge him as Lord, God will send you food. I don't know about you, that takes some guts, you know, I, I don't know, but Patrick was young and brave and confident. And so as Patrick tells the story, the whole crew bowed and prayed, acknowledging Christ as Lord. Half an hour later, a herd of pigs came across the road. <laughs> 
No pig, what do they call them, pig herder? I don't know. No, but just the pigs. So all of a sudden, these guys who were on death's door have ham and ate, well, probably not eggs, but had ham and uh, were able to sustain themselves. And there's wonderful adventures. Eventually, Patrick gets back home. He is welcomed by his family with the most incredible joy. They, this was someone returning from the dead. And so they were so overjoyed to receive him back now as a strapping young man, whereas earlier he'd been a teenager, you know. And so they put him back into the family business and everything is fine. And it seems like, you know, this is going to be the lived happily ever after sort of moment. But Patrick could not get those Irish people out of his mind. Even though they had captured him, destroyed his life, it would have seemed at the time, nevertheless, the overwhelming sense of concern for them the darkness in which they lived, their need for Christ, so riddled him that for the next five years he describes how he was constantly upset in his conscience and visited by dreams and visions and other sorts of uh, interruptions of his uh, equilibrium here that made him keep thinking about the Irish until finally he announced to his family he was going to go back to Ireland. And they said, you need to see a psychiatrist, you know. This is not a good move. They're going to recognize you. They're going to put you right back into slavery. This is not anything you want to do. But he was so determined that he actually finally made the decision. He knew he didn't have the requisite training. He was a firm believer in Christ, but he didn't have any kind of technical uh, education in these matters, at least uh, by those standards of those days. And so he went to France first and joined a monastery with the understanding he would only be there temporarily. He was there for five years. This was his seminary. And he studied the fathers, he studied the Bible, he studied all of these matters and became quite a competent scholar, quite a well-informed apologist for and representative of the Christian faith. And after those five years, in the year 420, ten years before Augustine's death now, I don't think they ever met, but just to keep the time frame in mind, he goes back to Ireland as a missionary. I don't think he looked like that. I think Ireland was a little bit too rough and tumble for that kind of garb, but nevertheless, that's the way one artist wanted us to remember him. And that's the best I could come up with, so there we are. He comes to Ireland and immediately just goes to the first kind of major village that he's aware of. This is kind of a famous incident. And the, uh, the character that is the chief, the chieftain of this village, who's fully given to the Druid religion, sees this odd character coming who speaks Gaelic. And Patrick comes in and he says, I have good news for you. And so this chieftain is willing to hear the good news. The, name's, the man's name was Dicku. I've always thought that sounded like something from Star Wars, you know, Dicku. But anyway... He says, okay, give us the news. And Patrick begins unabashedly to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on that day, at that moment, Dicku repents. The whole village turns to Christ. And at that point, that becomes his beachhead in Ireland. And from that point on, he just begins to be a representative of and spokesman for the Christian message throughout that region. Not everybody turned to Christ with such facility as did Dicku and the villagers there. And he went through some horrific adventures over the years. Rather than try to detail, I'm going to read you one short paragraph from one historian who describes what uh, uh, Patrick went through. Uh, His family and friends had been right about the danger. He soon faced great opposition. The Druids hated him for leading the people away from their idols. His opponents robbed, beat, imprisoned, and tortured him. Once he was again taken as a slave, 12 times his enemies nearly killed him, but but always the Lord rescued him. Patrick said, quote, daily I expect murder, fraud, or captivity, but I fear none of these things. I have cast myself into the hands of God Almighty, who rules everywhere. As the prophet says, cast your cares upon God, and he shall sustain you. So Patrick gives us quite a bit of detail. I'm skipping by most of it, but you get the feel. It was not an easy go. For 40 years, 
He was constantly in peril of life and limb, and yet for 40 years God protected him and maintained him and sustained him so that his ministry over those 40 years did become deeply entrenched in the Irish psyche, so much so that to this day, of course, St. Patrick is considered the patron saint of that, re of that uh, island. He had a huge impact on the slave trading. Up until that point, slaving had been just part of the economy. After 40 years of Patrick's influence, it had been brought virtually to a complete halt. Patrick himself, of course, deeply committed to this cause because he himself had been a slave, could speak with some credibility to it. And so his impact over those 40 years is really incalculable. And of course, we think of St. Patrick and St. Patrick's Day. I don't know how much memory of this actually people bring to mind, but nevertheless, uh, he had quite an influence. Thousands came to faith. I think the, uh, the best estimates are that tens of thousands of people throughout the island came to faith. Patrick is famous for some of his writings, his poetry, and so on, but probably the most famous expression of his uh, understanding of things is in something called the, the um, uh, breastplate of uh, Patrick. And the breastplate of Patrick is, of course, Christ himself. And this wording then came to be called the breastplate of Patrick, and you've probably heard it, and indeed I recall us singing this on occasion here in this church, so it's not unknown to us. And the words go like this, uh, I bind myself today the strong name of the Trinity by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. Christ be with me, Christ within me. Christ behind me, Christ before me. Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. You read those words and you realize that in the case of Patrick, that was more than just poetry. As he was going around this island where he was constantly threatened, he envisioned that Christ was his constant companion surrounding him like a protective bubble, you know. Christ above me, beneath me, around me, within me. He envisioned himself really in sense as the embodiment of Christ, as Christ was in possession of him and as he went on these various excursions throughout Ireland. And indeed, remarkably enough, this one man, without any armaments, without any protection, was nevertheless able for 40 years to have such an impact. That's why I believe that probably those statements by the Apostle Paul back in Romans chapter 8 were probably also in Patrick's mind because Patrick knew that the same God who had protected Paul and protected God's people down to his moment in history were protecting him. And my Sunday school lesson for you, my friends, this morning is that the same Christ who protects Paul and protected Patrick is with you. And when God sends you into situations where you feel a little bit out of your element, a little threatened, a little, you know, kind of over your head, whatever it may be, whatever the peril may be, that Christ is with you in that moment. And that is great good news for us. Amen.